Good evening. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church. Still in this book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 51. We just got the rest of 51 and then chapter 52 and the book of Jeremiah will be over. We're here at the time of the, the fall of Babylon. And remember, Babylon in the Hebrew is confusion. We, we, were, we, we picked it up in, toward the end of chapter 50 last night. And it, and it started out with by saying that, that those, those that oppress God's children, that, that they keep them in bondage and they don't want to let them go. That's those that they, they say, oh, just come, come back to church and you're, you're not doing the right thing if you don't give us tithes. You're not going to be blessed. You're not going to go to heaven if you don't come to church every single Sunday and give us tithes. That they put the people in bondage, and that that that's what false that's what false prophets, what false teachers do. How that how they put people in bondage rather than that's the exact opposite of what Jesus Christ does. Christ Christ gives us freedom. And and what did it say though? It said that even though there are those that oppress and that put my children in bondage. Our Father told us that their Redeemer is strong, and the Lord of hosts, Yahweh, is His name. So he, he is always there for those that do have a sincere heart and truly seek God with all that is in them. And it, ta it talked about how, how, how the Antichrist comes, out, comes up out of a swelling of Jordan. And remember, we, we mentioned how we read about that in Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 5. How it says that if you are wearied with the footmen, how, how are you going to hold up when the cavalry comes? So what he's saying is, if you can't even handle what's going on in your life right now, how are you ever going to be able to handle it when the Antichrist comes and when the fallen angels are here and when everyone just mocks you nonstop when you refuse to worship Him? If you can't handle what's the trials and tribulations in your life right now, you don't have a chance when the false Messiah actually arrives. And, and it said that those that do oppress, that oppress God's children, it says all the mighty men, the liars, the princes, it says that they are going to be completely cut off. And God told God's elect, those that, that, that do follow Him, that have a destiny, God told them to be brave and to show no mercy to the wicked. And how do you do that? You study God's Word as, as often as you feel led to. You get that wisdom and then you share the wisdom with others. And you, you show no mercy to the wicked. And we read about how, how Satan was the king of Babylon, the type. Is, it was the king of Babylon in history, and that is the type for the false Christ. And it said that the king of Babylon heard a rumor, and anguish fell upon him as a woman in travail. That birth of a new age is coming. And what's that rumor that he heard? People began to come out of the deception because the God's elect were delivered up. The Holy Spirit did speak through them. And then people heard that. And like it says in Luke 21, no one can gainsay nor resist when the Holy Spirit speaks. That cloven tongue that goes out in all languages. So then Satan's going to hear that rumor. People are coming out of the deception. And great anguish falls upon him because he knows that his time playing God is almost over. And he, even in Daniel chapter 11, verse 44, it says that he gets very angry and then he goes to utterly make a way and to destroy as many as he can. And then how does he destroy? By deceiving them into worshiping him. Not with the nuclear holocaust, not with war, but he comes in peacefully and prosperously as it says in Daniel 8.25. As it says in Daniel 11.24, he comes in prosperously and he spreads the spoil, the riches to anyone who will worship him. So that's how Satan deceives. But once again, God said, you be brave and you show no mercy to the wicked. And you study God's word to show yourself approved, to rightly dividing the word. So you can share it with others and bring them out of the deception. Those that they, they never, they, they went to church their whole life, but no one ever taught them God's word. So that's what your job is, is to teach people what the Bible says to bring them out of the deception. So we're going to pick it up in... Isaiah chapter 51, let's ask the word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for these many prophecies you've given us in the book of Jeremiah. We thank you for your whole written word. We thank you for giving us this building, this place that we can come to fellowship in your name and to share your word with others. And we ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear, to understand and teach your word. And we ask that your words be spoken tonight. Thank you, Father. In Yeshua, in Jesus' precious name, amen. All right, we're going to pick it up. Jeremiah 51. 
verse, what verse did we finish? Verse 30, is it 33? No, 17, I was way off. Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 17, and it reads, Every man is brutish. That means stupid by his knowledge. That means any man that just trusts in their own knowledge, they're stupid for it. They might know, they might have a whole lot of wisdom about the ways of the world, but if you don't have wisdom from God, then, then you really have no wisdom because just like it says in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, it says the fear or the love of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge, of all wisdom. So if you don't love God, you simply do not have wisdom, period. Every founder is confounded by the graven image, for his molten image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. This word confounded, it means to be ashamed, confused, or disappointed. And that's exact. That's what people are going to feel. They're going to feel all three of those emotions when they realize that those traditions that they followed, it was absolutely meaningless. The church system that they were brought up in that had them doing all types of different things. That, but it was never written in God's Word. And see, they're going to be ashamed and confused and disappointed by it. Because they were taught that their church is the one true church. All you got to do is follow everything that we say and you're going to be saved. Well, why would you listen to what a man says when you can listen to what Christ says? What our Heavenly Father says in His Word. Verse 18. They are vanity. That means they are emptiness or worth. They're absolutely worthless, useless, unsatisfactory. That's the definition of this Hebrew word. The work of heirs. In the time of their visitation, they shall perish. Once again, we have, we have that phrase, the time or the year of their visitation. That phrase that's almost exclusive to Jeremiah, being in the book of Jeremiah eight times, and only four times in the whole rest of the, the entire Bible, telling us, look, this is prophecy. That time of visitation, the vengeance is coming. So you better read and understand exactly what God's telling us in these prophecies. Verse 19, the portion of Jacob is not like them, Jacob being all twelve tribes of Israel. For he is the former of all things, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. Yahweh is the Hebrew when you see Lord in all caps. And the, the portion of Jacob, we talked about it many times. Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 28, where it says, Don't give the Zadok, don't give God's elect any inheritance, don't give them any possession. God says, I am their inheritance, I am their possession. Meaning you get everything when you stand up against the false Christ. The portion of, the portion of Jacob, it's not, it's not like the false teaching. It's not, it's not like the traditions of men because there is no inheritance in that. But you inherit God when you follow only Him and His Word. Verse 20, Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war. For with Thee will I break in pieces the nations. And with Thee will I destroy kingdoms. God saying, it's by you that I destroy the one world system. Who is this talking to? It's talking to God's elect. It was In history, it was Cyrus that was this battle axe. That one that God, he literally named Cyrus, the name of Cyrus, years and years before he was ever born. And he, he would even use Cyrus to rebuild the temple. And then God's elect were chosen before the foundation of this world. They were chosen before they were ever born. And they, they help rebuild the temple being, the, like it says in Revelation chapter 21, it says that, that there is no temple in the eternal heaven. Jesus Christ, the Lamb, and God is the temple. And it, say, it says in another place, and you, you don't help rebuild that, that God always is and always has been, and Christ always is and always has been. But what does it say in another place in Revelation? It says God's elect are the pillars that hold up the temple. And God uses you to, to do it, to bring down the, false, the, the falsehood, the deception. And you, you notice how it says, With thee, thou art my battle axe and weapons of war, for with thee will I break in pieces the nations. This phrase, with thee, is going to be used ten times, ten straight sentences in the next few verses. This is God saying, look, I am using you to bring down Satan. I'm using you to bring down the deception and to bring people out of falsehood. So what a privilege and an honor it is to be allowed to serve Almighty God, to be allowed to understand His Word and to share it with others. I hope, I hope you understand if you have eyes to see and ears to hear how much of an amazing blessing that is. He uses you to bring down the false one. Verse 21. 
And with thee will I break in pieces the horse and his rider. And with thee will I break in pieces the chariot and his rider. Bring, you're going to help bring down the fallen angels. And when Christ returns, all, all of them just disappear. They vanish. They no longer exist. Their soul perishes. And he uses you to do that. Verse 22. With thee also will I break in pieces man and woman. And with thee will I break in pieces old and young. And with thee will I break in pieces the young man and the, and the maid. Well, well, why is this happening? To bring, to bring them into the truth. Breaks them down. That's what God's Word does. It, it convicts people. And that's why so many churches, they just teach a soothsaying message. They don't want to offend anybody because then they might leave the church. They might stop giving them that money. But when, when you teach God's Word exactly as it's written, it convicts people. And it lets them know, look, you better come out of these traditions. You better come out of just listening to some man. And it, it breaks them down. And why? So they can live forever. So they won't be deceived by the false Christ. Verse 23. I will also break in pieces with, with thee the shepherd and his flock. The shepherd being the, the false teachers. But also the idle shepherd of Zechariah chapter 11. That's the Antichrist. Where it says that he doesn't seek out the young one. He doesn't seek out to help the poor. He doesn't seek out to help the hungry. He just goes to destroy just to make them spiritually dead. But God uses you to break him down. And with thee will I break in pieces the husbandman and his yoke of oxen. And with thee will I break in pieces captains and rulers. Even those earthly kings that, that are set up at the beginning of the five months. That one world system that's set up. And those evil spirits work in them. God uses you to bring them down also. Verse 24. And I will render unto Babylon and to all the inhabitants of Chaldea all their evil that they have done in Zion and in your sight, saith the Lord. And notice here it just says, and I will render. God letting us know he doesn't necessarily need our help. And if you don't want to serve God, somebody else will. There are those that truly love him. But he's saying, look, it's me that's doing it. What you do, you have no power. Any power that we have is what God gives us. Any abilities we have is what God gives us. So he's letting us know that it is I that does that am doing this. And just like, just like it says when at, at the very return of, of the true Jesus Christ, how it says that in, in Ezekiel chapter 38, how many nations will gather together to fight against them. It says that 180 pound hailstones are just going to fall right on them. That's the battle of Armageddon and the battle of Haman God. And God says that you, 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 uh, my children, you're not going to do the fighting. You're not going to fire one shot. It's because he wants them to know that he is God and to sanctify himself so that everybody knows there is one God and his name is Yahweh. So he will do that fighting all by himself with no help from us. Verse 25. Behold, I am against thee, O destroying mountain, saith the Lord, which destroyeth all the earth. That, that word uh, mountain is always symbolic of nations. And I will stretch out my hand upon thee and roll thee down from the rocks and will make thee a burnt mountain. Do you remember in Matthew chapter 17 of about right around verse 20 and the, the previous and following verses? Where first of all, you, you, you got a man that he, he's possessed with, with the spirit of a lunatic, lunar. That, that means it's, it's most, likely, most likely it was Satan's own spirit himself that possessed him. But then, you, but then you, you go down a few verses and, and God tells us that if you just have the faith of a mustard seed, then you can say, you, then you can say to this mountain, you, mountain you go and you, uh, you, cast all, you cast over there. You can pick up a mountain and put it wherever you want if, if, um, if you have the faith of a mustard seed. But what's that talking about? That's not actually saying you can just pick up and move a mountain. God could do that, but why would you want to do that? That's, what, that's Satan's method of operation to try to put on some type of show. No, what's that mean? The, the mountain is the nation. That's what a mountain is symbolic of. So what is that nation? That, that's the lunatic nation. That's the very offspring of Satan himself, the Kenites. And you, if, you did, if you have the faith of Almighty God, then the Kenites have no power over you. How, how, how they, and they sit in the highest places and they, they control the world. They pull the strings with education, with religion, with, with finance. But, but see, when you have the truth of God's word and you have that faith, that they have no power over you whatsoever. Verse 26. And they, shall not take, and they shall not take of thee a stone for a corner, nor a stone for foundations. But thou shalt be desolate forever 
saith the Lord. That stone, Psalm chapter 118, verse 22, says that the stone that the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. And that is Christ. He was rejected. He was crucified. And the Kenites, they rejected Christ even in the first earth age. No doubt that's why they were born as a Kenite, as an offspring of the serpent. And so they do reject Christ. And they will be destroyed and blotted out if they do not turn it around. And it could be in a flesh body or in the millennium. But if they choose to still follow their father at the end of the millennium, they will be cast into the lake of fire and blotted out. Verse 27. Say ye up a standard in the land. Blow the trumpet among the nations. Prepare the nations against her. Call together against her the kingdom of Ararat. That means the high holy place. Mini, that means division. And Ashkenaz, that means the spreading of fire. Appoint a captain against her. Cause the horses to come up as the, as the rough caterpillars. That's the locusts. And remember, God's elect's army, even though the locust army is that they, they set in, they stand in perfect lines and they don't touch each other. They're so organized. As God's been teaching us, God's elect, that army of God and the heavenly host above, is even much more advanced and disciplined even than them. Verse 28. Prepare against her the nations with the kings of the Medes. And that that's who would take over Babylon, Cyrus and the kingdom of the Medes, in history, the captains thereof and all the rulers thereof, and all the land of his dominion. Verse 29. And the land shall tremble in sorrow, for every purpose of the Lord shall be performed against Babylon, to make the land of Babylon a desolation without an inhabitant. And like we've talked about before, this makes sure that you know for absolute fact that this is prophecy. Babylon is Iraq of today. Are people still in Iraq? Yes, they are. But you know that this is talking about confusion anyway. Babel, confusion. Are there people still in confusion today? Yeah, there's a whole lot of people that think they're just going to fly away. And that they don't have to stand up against the Antichrist. That they just think that, oh, I believe in God. I love Jesus. I'm going to be saved. It's an amazing thing to love Jesus Christ. But how, can, how is he going to know that you love him if you won't even study his word? If you would rather fly away than stand against Satan. So yes, confusion abounds. So this is making us know this is completely prophecy. Because at the time when the true Messiah, Jesus Christ, returns, there will be absolutely no confusion whatsoever. Everybody will know who God is. Everyone will know who the Messiah is. And everyone will know His Word. Because that, that's, that's as it's written. It says that at that time of the millennium, you won't have to ask your neighbor, do you know Christ? Do you know His Word? Everybody knows it. Because you come back, you come back into total recall where you'll even remember the first earth age. So there's no such thing as confusion at that time. That's why as it's written, many people will even follow Satan at the end of the millennium. As it says in Revelation chapter 20. And if they follow Satan after being taught by Christ in person for a thousand years, they deserve to go to hell and they will and they will be blotted out. There is no more confusion at that time. And it said every single purpose that God has planned, it will come to pass. And it will all come to pass exactly as it's written. You can't fight God's plan. You can't change it. Verse 30. The mighty men, that's Geber in the Hebrew, of Babylon have forborne to fight. They stopped fighting. They have remained in their holds. Their might hath failed. They thought they were so mighty too. They, they, they became as women. That means that they became weak. But it would be a big mistake for you to think that women are weak. That's just, that's just a... a just a phrase, just a figure of speech. But so they became weak. They have burned their dwelling places. Her bars are broken. And that, that's exactly what it, when it, that's what's going to happen when they see the two witnesses rise from the dead. Three and a half days before Jesus Christ returns, Moses and Elijah, the two witnesses, will be killed in Jerusalem. And they'll be laid in the open square. And then three and a half days, they're just going to lay there. And it says people are all celebrating. They're rejoicing because these, these two men, that they, they have supernatural abilities. And they, they just vex the people because they wanted to worship their God, the supernatural entity, which is Satan himself. But you see, they vex the people because they were prophesying this is the false Christ. So Satan finally kills them. They lay in the street three and a half days. Then at the end of that three and a half days, they rise up. And what does it say? It says that a great fear fell upon all the people who rejoiced over it. Because they know that they were servants of the true God. 
And as the two witnesses are carried up by the heavenly host, Christ begins to descend and return. And that's when they, all these people have realized that they have been had, that they were worshiping a false Christ instead of the true. And they were, many of them were never even taught there was going to be a false Christ. Verse 31. One post shall run to meet another, and one messenger to meet another, to show the king of Babylon that his city is taken at one end. You see the word one end is in italics. This should read at each end. At every bit from one end to the other, all the confusion is done away with. It's, it's over with. Cut down with the truth of the Lord. Cut down by the Holy Spirit speaking through God's elect. Verse 32. And that the passages are stopped, and the reeds, they have burned with fire, and the men of war are frighted. Once again, it says that when they see the two witnesses rise, just a great fear comes upon them. And this fire, do you remember 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10? How it says, the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night. Why? They think Christ is already here, so they're not expecting Jesus to return. They think He already has returned. And then it says that the, that the fire will burn the elements, and that's the rudiments, stachion in the Greek. It means all the wickedness is completely done away with at Christ's return. Verse, verse uh, But there, there still is that millennium. Satan's locked in the pit, and he will be released out of that pit at the end of the millennium. So all evil is not completely blotted out until the end of the millennium, and the third earth age begins. Verse 33. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, the daughter of Babylon is like a threshing floor. It is time to thresh her. Yet a little while in the time of her harvest shall come. The threshing floor, that's where you separate the chaff from the wheat. So there's going to be separated those that truly love God and who serves Him. It's going to separate them from those that they just play church. They, just, they, they proclaim that they love God every Sunday. They take part in a church service that a, maybe a Bible has never even touched. Maybe you just, they just throw a few verses out there, but God's word is never actually taught verse by word, verse by verse, exactly as it's written. So it's gonna when Christ returns, it really separates those who work for God and those that just claim to work for Him, those that claim to love Him. I, I hear so many people say, "Oh, I'm, I don't, I'm not really going to study God's word. I'm just going to trust Him." Well, why would God take care of you when you're not even going to study His word? Makes no sense, but that's I've heard so many different people say that in life. All right, verse 34. Nebuchadnezzar, that's Nebuchadnezzar being properly translated. The king of Babylon hath devoured me. In the Hebrew manuscripts, this reads us. In all these places where it says me, it's us in the manuscripts. So Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, hath devoured us. He hath crushed us. He hath made us an empty vessel. He hath swallowed us up like a dragon. Well, why? Because Satan is the dragon. He's the Antichrist, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, all the same entity. He hath filled his belly with thy delicates. That means with thy luxuries. He hath cast me out. He said he hath, he hath made us an empty vessel. Well, if, you, if you've been worshiping Satan, do you think the Holy Spirit dwells in you? Do you think that God dwells in you? No. You're an empty vessel when you worship the false Christ. Verse 35, the violence done to me, or the violence done to us in the manuscripts, and to our flesh be upon Babylon. Shall the inhabitant of Zion say, and our blood upon the inhabitants of Chaldea shall Jerusalem say. So the, what, what this is saying, is they're not taking the blame. They're saying, oh, this has happened because of Babylon, because of confusion. This has happened because of the workers of confusion. They refuse to take the blame. They said, oh, well, well my, my pastor told me that I was just going to fly away. He just, he just got up there and just talked a whole lot about himself, about his family, about what he thought. So the people, that they refuse to take responsibility, even at that time when Christ returns. And that's why they go to him and they say, Jesus, we cast out devils in your name. We've done all wonderful works for you. And what does Christ say to them after they worship the false one? He says, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Even though they were in church their entire life, Christ said, I never knew you, even though you claimed to know me and you claimed to love me. You, he, you didn't love him enough to study his word, so is that real love? How would you feel if someone that you love wrote you a letter and you just never even touched it? You didn't even think about reading it. That's how God feels when you refuse to study his word. That's why 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, Study to show thyself approved, 
rightly dividing the Word of God so that you are not ashamed. So if you don't study God's Word, you are going to be ashamed. You're going to be disappointed, confused, just like we read in a previous verse. Verse 36. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will plead thy cause. That means I will defend the true servants of Yahweh and take vengeance for thee, and I will dry up her seed and make her springs dry. Verse 37. And Babylon shall become heaps, a dwelling place for dragons, an astonishment and an hissing without an inhabitant. There will be no confusion, and Satan, his role as Antichrist, is thrown into the lake of fire when Christ returns. That one world system thrown into the lake of fire when Christ returns. You can read that at the end of Revelation chapter 19. There will be no confusion. Everyone knows who Satan is. Yet at the end of the millennium, many will still follow them as it's written, and will follow him as it's written in Revelation chapter 20, about verse 7. Verse 30, verse 38. Or, yeah, verse 38. They shall roar together like lions. They shall yell as lions whelps. Why? Because they're hell bound. They're saying, oh no, this isn't my fault. I love you, God, even though I never studied your word. They're just going to yell. They're going to be shrieking out because the wrath of God is poured upon them. That's why it says in Revelation chapter 6, verse 16, that they hide in the mountains and the rocks. And they pray for the rocks to fall on them. They pray for death. Because they, they thought that they were worshiping God their whole life. They thought they were serving Him. And then when Satan arrives claiming to be God, they worship Him. So that they just shriek out for the pain and the embarrassment and the shame that they are feeling. You do not want to feel that way. I would recommend studying God's Word to show yourself approved. Verse 40. Verse 39, that is. Verse 39. In their heat I will make their feast, and I will make them drunken that they may rejoice and sleep a perpetual sleep and not wake, saith the Lord. Check out this word perpetual in your strongs. The word is olam. And it means to vanish out of time or out, to vanish out of mind for eternity. And that's exactly what happens to them. If they follow Satan at the end of the millennium, they are blotted out. It says in Psalm chapter 37, verse 20, that they're like, they're like the fat of a lamb that's on a spit and it drops and hit the grill and goes up in smoke forever and ever. That's what they are. They are completely out of mind for all eternity. That's why you will not even remember them. No one will remember them. It's as if they never existed when you're blotted out, when you're cast into the lake of fire. Like it says in Ezekiel 28, verses 18 and 19, Satan's death sentence. It says he's turned to ashes from within. They're not just going to be sitting there burning in a fire for all eternity. No, they're blotted out. They no longer exist. Olam. Verse 40. I will bring them down like lambs to the slaughter, like rams with the he goats. A lamb is completely helpless without the shepherd. And we are all completely helpless without our shepherd, Jesus Christ, this Yeshua, the Messiah. We are all helpless without him. And those that they worship the false Christ, they're brought right into the slaughter because they forsook the shepherd and they're spiritually dead. Verse 41. How is Shishak taken? We had this Shishak back in Jeremiah, I think it was chapter 25, verse 26. And, and what it is, it's a cipher. And in, in the Hebrew, what it, what it does is it, it, it puts the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet for the first letter and the second to last letter for the second letter. And so what this is, it's, it's C-H-C-H-C. But see, what, what it makes it is B-B-L, and that's Babel. So what this really reads is, is Babylon and not Shishak. And that's all spelled out for you in your companion Bibles. But it, we, we did talk about this before in a previous verse. So how is Babylon taken? And how is the praise of the whole earth surprised? Check out this word surprised in, in your strongs. It means manipulated. The whole world manipulated into falling after this supernatural being that performed miracles, that brought world peace to the entire world for the first time. They were all just manipulated by it. But you see, all you, you've read God's word, so you know what's going to happen. So you're not manipulated. That's just going to prove to you God's word is true. And you, don't, you all don't need that to be proven. You already know. But the whole world is going to be just manipulated by Satan and his one world system. 
How is Babylon become an astonishment among the nations? That, that word astonishment, it means consternation. And that, that means to be absolutely shocked and dismayed at something unexpected. How unexpected is it going to be when they see those two witnesses rise, when they thought that they were just false prophets? That's consternation. That's dismay. Verse 42. The sea has come up upon Babylon. She is covered with the multitude of the waves thereof. Just completely done away with. Verse 43. Her cities are a desolation because of the, because of the desolator, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. A dry land and a wilderness, a land wherein no man dwelleth, neither doth any son of man pass thereby. Once again, proving to us that this is all future, even to us today, it's all prophecy. Verse 44. And I will punish Bel, that's Baal, that's always the type for Satan, and the Antichrist. That's why it says in Romans chapter 11, verse 4, in the book of Kings, God said, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who will not bow a knee to Baal. Who will not bow a knee to the Antichrist. That's God's elect. And I will punish Bel in Babylon. And I will bring forth out of his mouth that which he hath swallowed up. And the nation shall not flow together any more unto him. Yea, the wall of Babylon of confusion shall fall. All those nations just flow right to him when Satan comes and he heals that deadly wound. The head of the deadly wound comes to the one world system. As you read in Revelation chapter 13, the first four verses. Well, when the deadly wound happens, people will start to come out of the one world system. Most likely because they're setting up the way that they, they're saying, you have to worship this way. You have to worship God. And you see, it's all pagan because Satan's the one that's running it all. So most likely Christian nations will decide to, to come out of that system. That, that's just that's what I think. That What I just said is not a fact from the Bible, but I think that's a pretty good guess. That's how the deadly wound will happen. Christian nations start to come out of the one world system. Then, then as it exactly is written in Revelation 13, 4, Satan arrives and he heals the deadly wound. And then it says, all the world wanders after the beast. It even says in Revelation chapter 13, 8, as well as Revelation 17, 8, it says that every single person that is not written in the book of life before the foundation of the world will worship Satan, will worship the Antichrist. Those that are written in that book of life, that's God's elect. Those that were chosen before the foundation of the world. Those that have eyes to see and ears to hear. And that study is word. Verse 45. My people, go ye out of the midst of her. Just like we read last chapter, God said, come out of confusion. Come out of it. Stop taking every man that claimed to be a preacher's word for it. Stop following all these traditions that have nothing to do with God's Word. God said, come out of the confusion before it's too late. That time is coming. And deliver ye every man his soul from the fierce anger of the Lord. Deliver your soul and stick to God's Word. And don't take any man's word for what they say. Verse 46. And lest your heart be, and lest your heart faint, and ye fear for the rumor that shall be heard in the land. A rumor shall both come one year and after, that in another year shall come a rumor. And violence in the land, ruler against ruler. And you know that it, it was violence back then in history. But at the future to us, it's just all peace and prosperity. The only deaths that there will be is spiritual deaths. Ru rulers, that there will be ten kings, ten earthly kings set up. And then when Satan arrives with his fallen angels, there will be ten supernatural fallen angels that Satan brings with him. And, and who, who knows even, even what they're going to be like. But it does say that the ten fallen angels, they all have one mind. And that they all, they all just follow Satan. They follow Satan so much that they refuse to be born of woman. That's why they have no chance at salvation. So that, that time is coming. But, but what's the rumor? Christ has returned. That's what everyone's going to say. I mean, it's going to be on every TV channel. That's all anyone's going to be talking about is Jesus Christ has returned. But are, are you studying enough, well enough in God's Word to know that that's just a complete lie? Are you going to listen to those rumors? I know that you're not. Verse 47, Therefore, behold, the days come that I will do judgment upon the graven images of Babylon, and her whole land shall be confounded. That means ashamed. 
and all her slain shall fall in the midst in the midst of her. All those that, that they even that they took pleasure in the confusion. Those that they took pleasure in, in sitting up at a pulpit and just deceiving all the people. This, just so they could get their money. I mean, that's what many people do it for. There are many good churches, but there are so many bad churches. But people think that they call it a church, but it's Beth of Inn, the house of nothing. But so many people think that just because someone claims to be a preacher, or just because a church claims to be a church, that, that, it's, that it's true, that's from God. God told us a million different places in His Word that there will be false prophets. And that's, that was Christ's first warning in Mark 13. He said, Beware lest any man deceive you, because people are going to be coming in my name, claiming to be Christian preachers. So have you read that or, or not? Or do you just listen to what some guy says? Verse 48, Then the heaven and the earth and all that is therein shall sing for Babylon. For the spoiler shall come up, for the spoiler shall come unto her from the north, saith the Lord. You, God's elect, are the ones that spoil the one world system and the reign of Antichrist. Remember how we read before how ten straight times God said, With thee will I break Babylon. With thee will I break confusion. And what an honor and a privilege it is to serve God and to be allowed to shoot those arrows that none of them miss into the into the working of Satan. Just always let the Holy Spirit guide you. And God lets you know every single tiny step to take for His ministry. God tells you what to do. That doesn't mean He speaks to you necessarily. But the Holy Spirit guides you to where you have no doubt what God's plan is for you. Verse 49. As Babylon hath caused the slain of Israel to fall, so at Babylon shall fall the slain of all the earth. And I just mentioned it, how it says, Every single person will worship Satan that are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Verse 50. Ye that have escaped the sword, go away. Stand not still. He's saying don't just stand there and do nothing. Those of you that know the truth, that have God's word in your mind, you share it with others. Don't just stand there. Go share the truth so people will come out of deception. Remember the Lord afar off. That means from wherever you are, you remember Almighty God and you remember His Word. That's why it says that in, in God's Word, it says that we are to meditate on His Word night and day. And let Jerusalem come into your mind. Jerusalem is that barometer of the end times. Where that, that's where Satan sits up his throne. And it's so many times in God's Word, He just lets us know, look, you watch Jerusalem. First of all, you know from our studies in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 35 and other places, that's where the Kenites dwell. Yeah, the Kenites are spread across the whole world, but their main spot, that, that is Jerusalem. So you must watch Jerusalem always. You always pay attention to what's going on in current events. Because it's all written. That's why Ecclesiastes tells us that there's nothing new under the sun. And every, basically everything that has happened will happen again. That's why we study the Old Testament in depth. Because it gives us the details of everything that is exactly going to happen. So you watch Jerusalem. And like it says in Luke 21, it says that when Jerusalem is surrounded with armies, the desolation thereof is near. That means it is almost time for Satan to be cast out. Verse 51. We are confounded because we have heard reproach. Shame hath covered our faces, for strangers are come into the sanctuary of the Lord's house. That's where Satan sits up his throne. And I, and I mentioned 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 yesterday, but when I, when I tried to say it out of my memory, I kind of butchered the verse. I want to go read it. Let's complete this study in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. That's where Satan and his fallen angels, that's right where they're going to be. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1. We're just going to cover four verses. Just like it says in 2 Corinthians 11, the fallen angels disguise themselves as ministers of righteousness. Where are they going to be? They're going to be right there in the temple in Jerusalem, claiming to be priests of Almighty God. That, that is what they're going to be doing. And they have almost the entire world deceived. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, let's read about the strangers that come into the temple of God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, and it reads, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto Him. Paul is saying, let's talk about how the return of Christ is going to happen. Verse 2, 
that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that day of Christ, as that hand. Saying, don't you be deceived by some false interpretation of the Bible, of 1 Thessalonians. Don't be deceived by that false rapture doctrine that people pull out of it. He's, he's saying, don't be deceived by any false spirit. So, so what's going to happen? Verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. The return of Christ shall not happen, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. I mentioned Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 18 and 19. Satan is the only person by name that is sent to death of the soul. He is the son of perdition. There is not a single other person that this could have to do with. So it's saying Christ is not returning until that son of perdition be revealed, the man of sin. One more verse to complete. What does Satan do? Verse 4, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And he convinces almost the entire world that he is God. So when you see in Jerusalem, when you see a supernatural entity, I mean, coming out of the sky, that's what he's going to do. That's why it says in Revelation chapter 6, verse 2, it says he comes on a white horse. And it says that he has a bow, except the word bow in the Greek is toxon, which means of the very cheapest fabric material. It's not the true rainbow that's, a, that's over the throne of Almighty God. It's just a fake, cheap imitation of it. And don't forget, don't forget what that transportation is of Ezekiel chapter 1. But when you see a supernatural entity, and he, he's arrived with what he claims to be angels, and they are fallen angels, except they're fallen angels, those that refuse to be born. And he sits himself in Jerusalem, right there in the temple. And he and he's tells and he's telling everyone that he is God. You've read in God's word over and over and over that that is the false one. If you are still in a flesh body, you know that it can't be Christ because 1 Corinthians 15 verse 52 says when the seventh trump sounds and Christ returns, everyone is changed into a spiritual body, even those that are deceived. So those strangers are going to be in the temple. Those that, that, and also, I mentioned 2 Corinthians chapter 11. There in verse 14, it says that Satan is transformed into an angel of light. Well, the word transformed is metakase matizo in the Greek, and it means to disguise. Satan is disguised as an angel of light. He's disguised as Christ. And all his fallen angels are disguised as priests, as ministers of righteousness. So are, are you going to fall for that? I, I sure know that you're not if you study God's word in depth. But so this fall of Babylon, God telling us two straight chapters. He said, come out of the confusion. Flee out of it. Stick to God's word and you, there will be no confusion. And God even says in His word that God is the author of peace, not the author of confusion. But so many people, they get caught up in the church system. They get caught up in traditions. I mean, do, doing literally everything but studying God's word exactly as it's written. That's how it is. You see it all the time. They will do anything but study God's Word. They'll read any book except the Bible. And it's just crazy. And they're in that confusion. They, have, they don't have eyes to see and ears to hear. But you, you stick to God's Word and you read it exactly as it's written. The entire Bible, not leaving anything out, not sugarcoating it, and not adding to it. It says in, about the Revelation 22, it's about five verses from the very last word in the Bible. It says that if any man takes away from God's Word, that I will take away, any, God will take away any blessings that may have had. And it says that if they add to God's word, I will even add to him the plagues of this book. So judgment begins at the house of God. That's 1 Peter 4, 17. So you, you better, especially if you claim to be a teacher of God's word, you better be teaching it exactly as it's written. Because you're not only responsible for yourself, you're responsible for your whole congregation. But everyone is responsible for themselves. And as we read, those people, they were trying to say, Oh, it's not our fault. It's just because of the confusion of why we are deceived. No, that's not going to fly with God. If you worship the false Christ, and you are taking part of those that are rejoicing when the two witnesses are killed, then they rise three and a half days later. And that fear, that paralyzed fear comes over you because you realize you've been had. Do not put yourself in that position. Study God's Word and come out of Babylon. And study God's word exactly as it's written. Let's go to his throne.
Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for leaving us no confusion in your word and just for spelling things out, just exactly how it's all going to happen. And we just thank you so much for these prophecies. We thank you for guiding us through this whole book of Jeremiah. We're, we're almost done with it. And we just thank you so much for giving us the wisdom of this great book. And we thank you for giving us this building that we can fellowship in your name with others and share your word exactly as it's written with others. And we just ask you to continue to guide us with your Holy Spirit to, to give wisdom, not just for us, but so that we can share it with others and so that we can be a good example to others to show them your love, Father. Thank you, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. This is recorded at Smyrna Christian Church, 1623 North Purdom, Kokomo, Indiana. Come join Pastor Jesse Sisk on Wednesday, Thursdays, and Fridays at 7 p.m. and Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. God bless. August 15th, 2019.